Because I thought that uh, as an opening set of remarks, I'd just bring you on the journey we've been on in science and technology for the last couple of centuries in particular. I mean, you could philosophize and say that it really starts either with the Enlightenment, with the establishment of the Royal Society under Charles II or back to Aristotle, but really the, 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 the pickup in, in R&D, and, and which has transformed our world, in, in, including socially. It was really in the late uh, 18th century, uh, John Dalton discovered what oxygen was. Before that was called phlogiston. You know. Uh, so, uh, but it's only 70 years ago that Howard Florey, who possibly uh, was, probably was the greatest Australian of all, uh, worked out how to produce penicillin in large quantities, and that was during World War II. And in so doing, he saved millions of lives. You know, most of the deaths in World War I weren't from, uh, from directly from, from bullets. They were from infections, that from, from wounds. And it was a, just a terrible tragedy. And since the introduction of penicillin and subsequent antibiotics, we've transformed the world. Uh, many of us would have died before 50 from infectious disease without antibiotics. And, so, and, and that's within our, many of our lifetimes. It was only 70 years ago that was done. And since then, there's been extraordinary advances in both our knowledge base and the treatments that are available. In terms of the knowledge base, uh, I think the, th the three big parts of what's called the molecular biology revolution, where we actually started to understand biology in molecular terms. So the first was the double helix, uh, the iconic image of the DNA structure, which is reflected in the staircase outside. That was in the early 50s. Uh, and then uh, 20, 25 years later, people worked out how to, to isolate and amplify so-called clone genes, which meant that we could get under the hood about all of the complex genes and proteins that constitute our biology and, and discover the genes that uh, mutated in cancer, the so-called oncogenes and tumor suppressors. And I'll actually just tell you a quick story about how that's done, because often when you come into places like this, you sort of you don't really understand the process or, and, and, and you know, what these guys do. And what we do is ask questions about things we don't know. And uh, the question that was asked in cancer uh, in the late 70s, early 80s was, we knew that some viruses would cause cancer. And there's one famous virus called chicken uh, rouse sarcoma virus. And, uh, but these viruses have very few genes. So the question was asked, once we had the gene isolation and cloning technology, are all the genes in the, the, the virus required to, to transform cells into cancer cells, or just some, or one? So that experiment was done because you could actually separate the genes. It turned out just to be one of those genes, only one, when put into cells in culture, uh, would turn them into angry, nasty tumor cells. And then the, it turned out very quickly that this gene that was in the virus was actually a mutated version of a normal gene that we all carry and that controls our cellular growth and development. And that was when the light switched on about what the true nature of cancer was. It was a genetic disease, I'll refine that in a moment, but a genetic disease that causes our cells to lose their normal growth control. You know, your nose has stopped growing a certain length, or not, unless you're Pinocchio, but uh, so this is very finely controlled, the length of fingers and toes, etc. But when the cells get damaged and they lose those controls, they start to grow and that's a tumor. And as they grow, they start to mutate further and they can leave the cavity in which they started and, and that's called metastasis and, and spread through the body and eventually kill you. So it's a genetic disease. Some of it is inherited. We think uh, maybe 30 or 40% and, and David Thomas uh, will talk later in the day, who's uh, the country's most outstanding cancer genomic uh, clinician scientist. Uh, I think it's around 30 or 40% of all cancers have inherited components, but many of cancers uh, also, or most, also have gen environmental components because when we say genetic, we mean it's caused by uh, you know, things in our DNA. But well, we've got DNA in every cell in our body and this DNA can be damaged by ultraviolet light, by chemicals, cosmic radiation, etc., and carcinogens like in smoking, which is why people tell you not to do that. So cancer is an acquired and inherited genetic disease. And through these molecular techniques, we've actually started to come to grips with it. Now, the third stage in this revolution, after the discovery of the structure of genes, the double helix, and our ability to isolate and analyze them and, and, and connect them with both normal and disease processes like cancer, and also neurodegenerative diseases, etc., was the ability to start to look in large scale at all of the genes at once, and so-called genomics revolution. So, uh, I guess around 15 or so years ago, uh, people in the United States and around the world decided it was time to use these technologies to actually analyze the full complement of information in the human DNA. 
That's six billion bits of information, three billion from mum and three billion from dad. An almighty effort, which many people thought was impossible and useless at the time. It's turned out to be neither of those things. It was done uh, in the end ahead of time, under budget, and has produced extraordinary insights into the genetic heritage that we all carry. As humans, we all carry 99.9% uh, .9 of our DNA in common. The 0.1% of our DNA that's different, we share many of those differences with well, other people in our you know, community and, and ancestry, but they are also what make us what we are as individuals. So you know that identical twins look the same because they've got the same genetic material. The reasons we look different is because we're all slightly different. And it's not just our physical characteristics, but also our psychological characteristics to a large extent and our uh, susceptibility to diseases. So this was uh, the first human genome sequence was uh, published in the about 10 or 12 years ago. It cost uh, just to generate the data 1,000 million US dollars, one billion dollars. Uh, but the advances, as I think Marcel will talk about in more detail, uh, in technology have been so extraordinary they made the computer revolution look like a tortoise, and it's actually it proceeded much faster. In the last decade, we've seen a one million-fold reduction in the unit cost of DNA sequencing to the point where we can now sequence just the base cost to get the data, a human genome for 1,000 US dollars. And you may or may not be aware, I don't know if you saw the news stories in January, but the Garvin Institute was one of the first three places in the world to acquire this technology, the other being Harvard University in Boston and Seoul, Korea. A couple more have been added, including the New York Genome Center. But you're actually sitting in one of the most advanced facilities in the world for analyzing human genetic information. The reason the Garvin was uh, selected for this, and they, the, the, we were actually approached by, by the Americans to, it was partly because they feel that the Australian healthcare system is a terrific place to, 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 in, in, to establish this technology because now it's at a price point where we can do large research projects but also um, use it in the clinic in ways that Marcel will explain in more detail and I'll mention briefly. Uh, also because this institute's got such a, an outstanding international reputation and some of us here have been in the business for a while. So um, we are now poised to be able to deliver uh, massive population scale genome sequencing to understand the etiology and the origins of cancer, osteoporosis, type 2 diabetes, neuropsychiatric diseases like autism, neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's and Alzheimer's, and really get under the hood of the things that really do affect our community, particularly as we age, because most of the complex diseases increase, as we all unfortunately realize, uh, in, in frequency as we get older starting to get a touch of arthritis, which is reminding me of my mortality. When we started to look at cancer genomes using this technology here, uh, we discovered that cancer, and this was, uh, when we looked at pancreatic cancer and published that last year, we, 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 we discovered that cancer um, was not only a very heterogeneous disease with multiple origins, which was fairly well understood, but also um, that the range of mutations damage to our genes that cause cancer was similar in different cancers. Not identical, it was a different spectrum in some cases, but the range was pretty similar. So that mutations which were well characterized, for example, in particular types of leukemia, and for which effective drugs had been developed, were actually also occurring in colon cancer or pancreatic cancer or whatever. And so we could repurpose those drugs to treat people who were suffering those same mutations. And those clinical trials are underway. For example, we discovered that 4% of mutations underlying pancreatic cancer, which is one of the most lethal cancers, I think it's 95% of people that are uh, unfortunately no longer with us within 12 months of diagnosis, 4% of those mutations are in a gene called HER2, which is commonly mutated in breast cancer, for which a very effective treatment's available. So we're now trialing the breast cancer drug on that subset of patients. Now, if you think this through, it means that uh, for cancer diagnosis and treatment, it's now important to know not only what tissue it is and look down the microscope at the anatomical or cellular pathology, but actually the sequence of cancer to know exactly what mutations are causing the cancer because that will have a very big bearing on what drugs may be effective, which is very important. Equally important is that it will tell us what drugs won't be effective and a lot of very expensive drugs and expense won't be unnecessarily um, wasted because of um, uh, not knowing what the details are. So I think, uh, and, and of course, one of the things about a research institute like this one that people, I think, don't, and even we in it, don't fully appreciate is that we have two jobs in society. 
One is to contribute to the canon of knowledge about understanding human biology and disease, but the other is to be the portal to the world of knowledge that brings in the knowledge advances from all around the world, the new technologies, and helps to translate that as quickly as possible where it's practical and you know, to do so, timely to do so, into the clinic through clinician scientists like Anne and David Thomas that you'll hear from later. So it's a very important role we fulfill in society because we're the lightning rod for the new technologies. And as I said, we're one of the first three places in the world to have this technology and therefore New South Wales and Australia has that technology. We'll also be using it to uh, diagnose uh, genetic disease. This may surprise you as a figure, but 1% of all babies born in, our, in every society have significant genetic problems. Individually, the genetic diseases are very rare, cystic fibrosis being one of the more common of them, but still very rare, one in 2,000 or so. But when you add them all up, it's about 1%. Now, 25 years ago, it took an army of researchers to track down the mutation causing cystic fibrosis, and it was quite a milestone at the time. Now we can diagnose something like 30% of all mutations within a week, uh, which then gives the clinicians, gives the family a better understanding because they're searching for that, it's very important to them, uh, but also gives the clinicians a much clearer idea of what the treatment options may be. And in many cases, in some life transforming cases, the children have been rescued from a, a life of disability by having this information. So we're now working very actively with uh, uh, clinical geneticists and genetic pathologists around the country to to work out how we might introduce this into the clinic uh, so that uh, parents who are uh, born with a child with a, a difficulty can uh, have that difficulty diagnosed and hopefully productively treated as quickly as possible. I think uh, I've just realized I've hit the 15 minutes so I better wind up but uh, you'll hear much more about this during the day. This is the most fascinating area. There's lots of social issues, ethical issues, privacy issues. We're in a new world and I call it the genus, genesis of the genome generation. I, I like alliteration. I did study English when I was at school. The genesis of the genome generation. And that it's, it's really, everybody is really uh, now foreshadowing very confidently that within the next five to 20 years, we're not sure exactly how long, but uh, whole genome sequencing become routine, uh, possibly at birth, uh, and that it'll be part of your medical records. And when you go to see a doctor, instead of turning up with a crisis, you'll turn up from time to time and you and the, your physician, he or she, will sit down and work out what what risks you may have and how to uh, prevent those, reduce those risks. Your risk for type 2 diabetes, don't get overweight, or you've got an elevated risk for colon cancer, then you better have some more regular checkups, etc. because early intervention is the key to treating cancer. So we're into a new world and it's been said um, that this genomic revolution will have as big an impact on medicine as antibiotics. I think that's true. Medicine in 20 years will be totally different. It'll be the science of wellness rather than the art of crisis management. And you're seeing here um, a very, very well-informed and early uh, uptake uh, insight into this amazing new world of understanding human genetic variation and, and how that plays into uh, improving health for our entire society. So welcome. I uh, hope you love the day. I'm, I'm sure you're going to go away buzzing because I've heard these people talk and what they have to say is just amazing. So I'm just the entree and uh, welcome and enjoy the day. Thank you. Thank you.